Welcome to AI Arthritis Voices 360. This is the official talk show for the International Foundation for Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis, or AI Arthritis for short. My name is Tiffany Westridge Robertson. I am one of the co hosts of the show. And today I am joined by another fellow patient co host and one of the best rheumatologists that we know. Dr. Lisa Zicker. So, oh, thank you. oh, was that a good intro or what? That was the best. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> and then the amazing Miss Carrie Wong. Hey, Carrie. Hi, everyone. I am definitely glad to be here for this important conversation. Wonderful. So we're going to swing back and get a couple introductions here. So I am the CEO of the organization, and I'm also a person living with the diseases, primary diagnosis, non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, but you know, there's some more in there. And Carrie, why don't you give a little, oh, and I'm tuning in from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I am Carrie Wong. I'm here uh, tuning in from New York. And I think that there's a little bit more in there is pretty much the perfect answer for all of us. My uh, rheumatologist calls it my autoimmune soup. And some of the um, main ingredients are a rare disease called sarcoidosis um, that affects um, my joints as well as the whole lot of other areas. Um, but I also have uh, Sjogren's syndrome and rheumatoid arthritis and a handful more. All right. And Lisa, a little Hi, about my- you. Oh, yes. Lisa Zicker here, tuning in from St. Louis, Missouri as well. I am a rheumatologist and I take, should I keep going? (laughs) Yeah, do that again. I don't know what my, my, I thought I had my sounds turned off and they're going bing, bing. Sorry, Ryan. Go ahead. And Lisa, tell us about yourself. (laughs) Hi, I'm Lisa Zicker. I am a rheumatologist tuning in from St. Louis, Missouri. I have a general rheumatology clinic and um, I also do a lot of teaching. And so I have a, a passion for trying to both role model and emulate and teach my trainees how to best interact and work with people living with autoimmune and rheumatic diseases. And I love how, Carrie, you said that your rheumatologist describes it as your autoimmune soup, because I usually use the analogy of a buffet. <laughs> you just go and you take a little bit of everything. Um, so food analogy is always a few, a few <laughs> for many reasons. Nice. So as you could see, Lisa and I both said St. Louis, Missouri. So uh, we're also going to have on an extended component of this same episode, Dr. Al Kim, you might know him as Dr. Al or just Al, he's gone by all of them. And uh, he's my rheumatologist in St. Louis, Missouri. That's how I met Lisa because he introduced us. And then Lisa and I and AR Arthritis have done some wonderful work together. So when it was time to come back to one of our spinoff shows that we call Roomy Rounds, which is where patients and rheumatologists come to the table and talk about some topics that you might not talk about necessarily when you're in the office, especially this topic, which is about the good, the bad, and the ugly in office visits. So clearly not going to talk about that when you're in the office. Maybe just the good. You might talk about the good and the office. Maybe not so much the bad and definitely not the ugly. (laughs) And and yet I think sometimes those are the things that we really need to address more than anything. Absolutely. To be able to do that here. And that is why this topic was inspired. That's exactly, Carrie, what what happened. So at our organization, what we do is we, as people living with the diseases, listen to other people living with the diseases. And we start to identify issues that are persistent, that need to be solved in some way, shape, or form. And we were getting a recurrent rant that was showing up in social media or or in our rant hotline, which we do have at aiarthritis.org backslash rant. You can submit anything you want anonymous and you will not be judged. So we were getting a lot of gripes about, I'm not happy about this happened at my rheumatology office. That happened. I wasn't listened. I wasn't heard. Things of that nature. And we said, you know what? Maybe we need to create a resource, sort of an ebook is where we're going with this. We're Originally, we thought collect these stories of the rants that we were getting, but then also the good, because you need to know what a good experience is 
as well. And it's always easy to gripe about something we're not happy about, but I think equally as important, what does constitute a good experience at the rheumatologist office? And what do rheumatologists think qualify as a good or maybe not so good situation? But only if we communicate those issues together and put them out there as a resource, maybe we can then at the end, we'll recommend some best practices. And after it's all said and done, all parties will be able to identify what the other feels is the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> I just like saying that. So let's jump, let's jump right into this. And I'm going to turn it over to Carrie because Carrie had written an article. And you can tell a little bit about just where that article came from and the premise, which really I think sets up what we're going to talk about here on the show today. Sure. So um, I have a column at Sarcoidosis News um, is uh, a really great site for information and perspectives, all of that. And um, I have a column I write twice a month about my experience with sarcoidosis, with chronic illness. Uh, and one of the pieces that I had to write um, a while back was uh, I called it, uh, it was, I'm going to get the title wrong now, but it was uh, about when my doctor took 19 vials of blood from me in one office visit. That made me actually fall in love with her because I have had so many doctors um, before. I think she's my seventh rheumatologist just on its own, not to mention all of the other ologists. And there was just so much in, you know, that that was a, a symbol of, and that was the beginning of really showing me something that I had been lacking in that I, from a lot of other doctors that I'd seen before. Um, she, you know, was thorough. I mean, what, 19 vials of blood, they actually, <laughs> they had to stop midway and go to the other arm because they needed so much. But it was from all of those tests that she was able to find out so much more information, things that explain so much of what I had been experiencing and previous doctors couldn't or wouldn't give me any answers or, or follow a path from there. And so that was just such a great example of what made me love her. Um, and uh, it's, I've been with her about a year and a half now, and I just continue to love her more and more every time I uh, see her, every interaction that we have. So I just want to expand a little on what you just said. You said uh, the doctors wouldn't or couldn't tell you or fill in what you needed. Can you just expand a little bit on that? Sure. So um, trying to give a sort of condensed version. I, I know. And, I, and now I'm asking you to talk more. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Um, so the, the condensed version of um, my sort of story leading up to that is I was experiencing a myriad of symptoms that just never seemed to make sense. I was getting dizzy. I was having joint pain. I was having muscle aches, all kinds of things starting back in 2007. And um, the beginning of 2008, I decided, okay, something is wrong here. I need to start, you know, I need to see a doctor. I need to find out what's going on. And I spent four years going from doctor to doctor to doctor with them completely dismissing me because although I said, you know, a laundry list of symptoms, they said I looked fine. And the tests that they ran didn't really show much. And they just kind of left it at that. And I was just stuck. Um, and then after that, I developed some new symptoms that were actually more visible, um, some uh, joint swelling and rashes that, you know, they, they couldn't, they could no longer tell me, hey, you know, this is just in your head, maybe you're just depressed. I think that's one of the things so many of us have heard so often. And it's, um, it, it seems to be what doctors will say, what many doctors, I don't want to say all of them, but <laughs> what many doctors have said when they don't see an answer or they don't see an easy answer, they just tell us that there's nothing wrong. And when I finally had these new symptoms that, you know, were clearly not in my head, depression does not make your ankles swell up so that you can't put your shoes on. Um, I finally had somebody who said, okay, yes, something is wrong. <laughs> and then I spent another four years of rotating diagnoses. Maybe it's lupus. No, I don't think it is. Maybe it's RA. No, I don't think it is. And we went through you know, so many different diagnoses. And then we came up with sarcoidosis. And again, this is a rare disease. It's not something I would expect people to find right off the bat. But then 
because it's a rare disease that can affect so many different organs and systems throughout the body, um, it really needed to be addressed or examined kind of top to bottom. But most of the doctors that I had were not familiar with sarcoidosis. And as a result, if there was a new symptom that I said, I have this problem, they said, oh, well, it's probably the sarcoidosis. Or if I said, you know, I have, you know, do you think this might be, they said, no, I don't think it is. And they'd kind of just brush it off without any further examination because they didn't understand what sarcoidosis was. So they also didn't understand what was and what wasn't. And that's where I, you know, had a lot of trouble getting answers. And this rheumatologist who I see now, she understands sarcoidosis and she's able to see which things fall under that category, which things fall under other autoimmune arthritis categories, which things fall under a different specialist purview. And so I really have that well-rounded approach, which I really, really needed. And so many of us do. Got it. All right. I'm going to turn it over here to Lisa in a, in a minute to comment on this because we want to hear a little bit about your experience. We know that there are a lot of times I'm sure where people come in and they're not ticking all the boxes. And for us as patients, they're so often will feel dismissed or not heard. And I know Lisa, you and I talked about several articles that have come out recently in the last year. I know there was one that was highlighted quite often at ULAR 2022 conference that was on this idea of being dismissed and what that does to break down a breakdown of communication and trust and how that can even impact healthcare. So I just thought it would be a good opportunity just to weigh in on that's got to happen to you, right? As a doctor, people come in, they, they're not ticking the boxes, their labs look great, but what do we do? How do you handle that as a rheumatologist? Yeah. So I think the first thing is that, so I, I, I explain that rheumatology is like art appreciation. And so, because there are, for our diseases, there are, there's very rarely is there one test that is going to definitively say, yes, this is what you have. Um, as opposed to other medical conditions, you know, like hyperlipidemia, your cholesterol is either high or it's not, or diabetes, <laughs> your sugar is either high or it's not. And we really don't have things like that in rheumatology. Instead, it's very much a clinical specialty where we listen to patients, we hear their symptoms, and then it's up to the doctor to interpret the labs and the diagnostic studies in the context of those symptoms. Um, and, you know, because of that, it is imperfect. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a couple of um, themes that I'd like to capitalize on that Carrie just shared. Yes. And the first is this concept of uh, nonspecific symptoms and then being told, oh, you're depressed. It's all in your head kind of thing. Um, so autoimmune conditions, we, they, they develop over time and we know that some people, they get all the symptoms all at once. And it's very obvious, you know, like, like you come in with the rash and the joint pain and all the other things like, boom, we can diagnose that. Cause you fit kind of what we call an illness script. You, you fit the description of what a condition looks like, which is what we're trying to do as rheumatologists match patient symptoms to what these conditions sound like and look like in real life. But for those patients who don't have that boom, all of a sudden, everything all at once, and instead they kind of have this gradual progression of accruing nonspecific symptoms over time, it can be really challenging because there are many, many people in the world that have similar symptoms that don't have an autoimmune disease. And we don't wanna misdiagnose somebody and put them on medications that can cause a lot of harm, especially nowadays in a pandemic. And more so, as I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast is familiar with, our, auto, our immunosuppression doesn't really help fatigue all that much. And it doesn't really help the nonspecific symptoms all that much. It's very frustrating. So, um, usually how I explain it to patients is that, you know, like at this point in time, I don't think you, and I, so two things there at this point in time, and then I don't think everything's hedged. So I don't think you have an autoimmune disease, but something can always develop in the future. And so if 
something more develops, you know, please come back and we will repeat the assessment because that's the best I can do at that point in time. And I'm, I don't know how other physicians do it, um, have that conversation, but the hope is really by saying just that simple sentence and kind of setting the stage in that way, validating that you are having these symptoms, explaining that they don't really, they're, they're non-specific, they don't necessarily fit any one disease and that things can progress and my door's always open, come on back whenever something else happens. Um, so that's my approach. I don't know how, Carrie, I don't know how you, how that conversation happened with you in the past. I'd be curious to hear how, how that went down. And um, even I'll take the feedback. Like how, how, <laughs> how does that sound? Should I, should I change up my spiel? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's funny as um, you know, everybody can't see this because, you know, this is an audio show at the moment, but um, I have been sitting nodding my head vigorously as you have, you know, with everything that you have been saying, there are so many points of that, that, um, you know, on the rare occasion I found I've been really excited about or the, the things that I wish that I had had with previous doctors, you know, and that was, you know, things that you said, the, you know, one of the first things that you said, even when you were introducing was, you know, that you, um, you, you, are, are helping to teach and to train other people as far as the communication and that communication is so critical you know in in some cases that communication is more important than the lab tests and you know that you listen to your patients and you know that you you know you said at this time we I don't think it's this but it could develop into something else and so you're giving us you're giving your patients you know the 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 best that you have at the moment, but also explaining that that is you know explaining why and how this is so difficult to pinpoint and not just turning it into a blame game, not just dismissing your patients that there's nothing wrong. If I don't have an answer, then there is no answer. It's just you, um, you know. Or many doctors have you know turned and sort of like spun it around and just kind of make us feel like it's our fault um, for being sick. Like we've done something wrong and we just need to be better. And, you know, you acknowledge and, and I understand, we understand that these are really, really complicated conditions with so many symptoms that vary with so much overlap with other things, with other conditions, with other, you know, treatments and side effects and, um, you know, contraindications, there's so much and it is so complex. And, you know, at, at this point, I don't expect anybody to have all of the answers. Um, and, you know, I mean, I used to think, I think growing up, we thought you get sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor knows everything, they make you better, have a nice day. Um, and what we have learned is, at least in, in the case of, you know, chronic illnesses, in the case of autoimmune, autoinflammatory conditions, it's just not that simple. But I think one of the best things that you said, Lisa, and one of the best things that I think we can get from a doctor, honestly, is knowing their own limitations, knowing when you don't know everything and being able to acknowledge that. And it's not a fault of yours that you don't have that background just yet. You haven't encountered this symptom before. Um, and it's not my fault for bringing you something that doesn't make sense. It's just the fact. And what that means is at this point, maybe we need to ask somebody else to kind of get in on that. And, um, you know, that I think is just one of the biggest um, and most important things is being able to be real, be honest with the patients about, you know, how much you know, where you're not so sure, um, and that we can figure things out together as we move forward. So I just want to piggyback on what you just said, Carrie. So, and Lisa as well. So you said, Lisa, you had said, you know, you're the best you can really do is at this point in time, I don't think. And I, I think that it's the way you say those and with the compassion associated, because think about how that could be in context. Like at this point in time, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. You know, like, I mean, there's a way that, that things, because I think wow. people hear certain, uh, the, the way that 
inflection and in, in that type of thing. And patients, I talked to Al, Dr. Kim, about this in a prior episode before. Patients come in the office with baggage. We come in with everything a previous doctor said before us. So if we're just wanting so badly to get a diagnosis, I think what I'd say, Lisa, is as a doctor, I would definitely want to know, am I the first rheumatologist or the fifth? Because your, your rea- they could be more like feel defeated by that. And it might take more, more empathy on the side of the doctor to really be encouraging and let them know, don't give up. Well, I'm here to help you through this so that they don't feel defeated. I hope that that makes sense. I guess in my mind, so I, I'm hearing everything you're saying, and I agree that you know, nonverbal communication is like 90% of, of the message. Um, I, 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 my one reservation is that, you know, sometimes there isn't an autoimmune condition yep. and, um, there are a lot of other medical mental health conditions that can cause very similar symptoms. And so when we offer our opinion a lot, many times, not always, um, but sometimes patients are very disappointed with that. And, um, you know, I can package it as empathically as possible, but like you said, Tiffany, like they're coming in and they want, they want the diagnosis that they know has a treatment for it. That's easy. Right. Yeah. Like I, I have rheumatoid arthritis. You're going to give me some, something, and it's going to turn this around in a couple of weeks or months. Um, and that's not always the case. And so I, from the physician perspective, it helps when patients are open to the message, especially if we're the fifth rheumatologist and we're saying the same thing. That's a good point. <laughs> um, a good point. So because we're not there to crush your hopes or ruin your dreams, we're there to offer, we're there to partner with you and offer you our, our opinion and our interpretation of the art appreciation data, right? Um, and it, it's hard for us too to sometimes have these conversations because we want we want there to be a, all tied up in a nice little bow, a diagnosis and a simple straightforward treatment, but that that's not reality. That's not the life in which we live. And so I think that that's an important part of this conversation as well, not just, you know, the physician being empathic and receiving and listening, but that goes both ways. Um, Patients need to also be receptive and and hear what it is that we're trying to say um, rather than kind of interpreting it in a different way. Absolutely. That's a really, really great point, actually. And I'm glad that you can see that's exactly the beauty of the show, Roomy Rounds, and why we do this, because who's going to talk about this in an actual doctor (laughs) setting? And I feel like that makes a lot of sense. And as a patient organization, we do get a lot of patients that come in and feel very disappointed. And, And I think that's also why many of us, when we finally get a diagnosis, we feel relieved. There's this sense of almost happiness. And the, the, so we, that's a very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Carrie, just, you, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say, just like kind of brainstorming. I wonder if there's some way for patients who are new to this journey to help them maybe reframe um, that sense of like relief or satisfaction with a visit more so on, was I listened to? Was I heard? Rather than did I get the answer that I was looking for? Mm. Because sometimes, you know, here's a great example. You know, it took eight years to, to figure out the right answers and it can take a lot of time. And if that's the end goal, um, it can maybe be dissatisfying as opposed to have I found a partner that will at least walk on this journey with me. Yeah. And I just, I think, you know, so so two things that I, you know, I think to to kind of pinpoint uh, to to piggyback on that. You know, one word that I heard you say a few times um, is that you're partnering with your patients, and that is something that I think is sadly in my personal experience, I would say I would say rare, um, <laughs> but really really important. Um, that you know, it's not a matter of we come to you, you tell us what to do, we do as you say, end of story. But it's a matter of we're gonna talk this out and we're gonna 
try and do the best we can to figure out what might be causing any of the things, what we're looking for out of this visit, um, and and what is our best path forward. And you know, I think that's really important. And like you said, there, you know, the other thing I wanted to kind of point out um, is, you know, you said. Uh, I mean, we all kind of know that this isn't always an easy and it's not, there's not always an answer. Um, you know, some, it, it might not be a, an autoimmune disease. It might not be, you know, something that we can look at and say here, X, Y, Z. Um, and while that is what we're looking for, obviously is an answer <laughs> and a solution. Um, when that's not there, you know, it's, it's coming back to that, um, that inflection and that communication. It's, you know, if I come in and I say, look, I'm sure I have rheumatoid arthritis. This is the treatment I should have. Here's why I think so. And you just say no, <laughs> that, you know, then we're going to have, you know, a problem. I'm going to come away from that um, feeling very negatively about that experience. Um, but if you explain what it is you're seeing, what it is that you would be looking for that would lead you down that direction. Um, you know, it's, it, it's really just, you know, the more information that you could offer in both in terms of what you're seeing or, and in terms of what you're not seeing um, that helps us to say, okay, where do we go? You know, where does that leave us and what do we do next? Um, and if I could just get in that one other point, I think is so important is that what do I do next, or where do where do we go from here? Um, because one <laughs> issue I've had with a lot of doctors, and sadly I know a lot of other people who have as well, is we come into the doctor and we say I have X Y Z symptoms, and they say, oh okay, so we will do you know A B C tests, and then they call us up and they say, great news, A B and C were all negative. You don't have that. Have a nice day, and then we're stuck. Because, okay, it might be good to know that we don't have those particular conditions. Those might have been scary and it might be, you know, a relief to know it's not that. But we're not done. You know, we're, we're still sitting here with those same issues that we came in with. And if the doctor is done and thinks that's the end of the conversation, it just kind of leaves us hanging. Um, and so having that, here's why. And here's what we can think about now. Here's what we can look at now. Here's, you know, some other things that, um, you know, we can kind of monitor for. Did you want to respond to that, Lisa? Yeah, I had I, something I didn't to know if, I saw I saw your writing. I didn't know if there was another question coming. So I, so I, I think that's a great point. And um, I think, you know, from like, I'm probably guilty of that myself um, <laughs> sometimes, because in our mind, like we're always we're always worried about mm, ruling out or making sure that it's not either a complication of an autoimmune or autoinflammatory condition from medication, something new, and then when all that comes up negative, then what do we do? And um, and usually that's then it gets to the point of we don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't I don't know why you have it good news, all the scary stuff was negative and it wasn't that. Um, and so I, I think also that probably, and this is not, this is an excuse and not a good, a good reason, but it probably also just comes from, you know, trying to be efficient and, and lack of time um, or, and, you know, closing the loop and circling back. Um, and so if that ever, I, I, I try, you know, when in that, those situations, when I give the results, I try to say, are you still having whatever symptom it was? Um, or give advice like, you know, what I worked up was negative. I recommend you follow up with your primary care physician because I don't think this is related to your autoimmune disease. But if that doesn't happen, I really do hope that my my patients reach out and are like, okay, Dr. Zicker, hey, remember? <laughs> what are we gonna do next? Um, because it may have been just that I, you know, I, I, I missed on a detail, um, but that's a really, really excellent point. And I don't think, I, I don't think anyone's intentionally trying to leave you hanging. Um, and I definitely wouldn't want to do that. And so it's something that I can, I can work towards being better at. 
I think that in a lot of cases, people like myself, for example, I have never had a positive lab in my life ever. They all, everybody tells me you have perfect blood work. And that is a challenge. We hear that so often. And it's got to be just frustrating too, as a doctor, you obviously want to give answers and you're running all of the tests. And that leads, I guess that leads back to this whole, the patient feeling like no one believes me because I'm feeling this, but it, no test is detecting yeah. anything that's mm -hmm. happening to me. And so I circled a big word that kind of summarized, I think what you were both talking about, and that's really information sharing. And there's so many contexts that fall under that. And I think when we're talk, thinking about times that we've had good experiences with the rheumatologists in the office, it often revolves around good information sharing. The doctor is providing us with explanations, like Carrie said, okay, this is why I might not think it th is this, or this is something maybe you should go learn a little bit more about. This could help you. That So good information sharing. And I think at the same respect, when you don't have good information sharing and you're left with a lot of questions or the, the time and there's not follow-up during the between the portal or whatever that is, that lack of information sharing, I think can be extremely detrimental and can really shape that what be, is good and what is perceived as bad. And if I can just add one thing, <laughs> kind of flipping on the other side, I think we as patients need to take a little bit of responsibility for that ourselves too. Um, you know, just as an example, you know, my mom and, and grow, you know, growing up, my mom, my grandmother, anybody like people, they had it, they got sick, they went to the doctor, they got this medication, that's all there was to it. And if I, if I was asking my mom, you know, what happened, what did they say about this? And what do you need to look out for? And do they think it could be related to that? The answer was very often, I don't know. Because if the doctor wasn't offering that explanation, she wasn't asking for it. And, you know, years ago, I also wasn't asking for it. So I've had, um, you know, some medical issues in a different area um, that I now wonder if, you know, how much was the stuff I was dealing with in, in college, how much is that related to the other issue that I had when I was 30? And I don't really know because I didn't ask questions back then. So I, there's all that information that I don't have and can't get from 20 something years ago. Um, but, you know, it's because I didn't think to ask. It wasn't, I didn't realize how important it was for me to ask questions, for me to try and find out and learn all I could about whatever it was that I was dealing with in my body. And so I think um, absolutely, uh, we, we want our doctors to offer as much information as they can. Um, but I think we also need to take it upon ourselves to make sure we ask the questions that are weighing on our minds. If they say, here, I want you to take this medication, ask about it. You know, what is it going to do for me? What is it going to do to me? Um, you know, what side effects should I look out for? You know, anything. It's, we have to remember, you know, if we want them to be, to think of us as partners and working together to come up with solutions, that means it's also partly on us to come up with the questions too. I think that's great because it helps a lot. Um, I mean, from a physician perspective, there's so much I can tell you, right? I can, I, I can, I can just cite the doctor version of Wikipedia, and for some people, I'm gonna lose them if I do that. And so it help, it helps us mm -hmm. so much when you come with specific questions, so that we can give you the information that you specifically are looking for. Um, I think the other part of that is. Sometimes these conversations are, are just best done in person or in a visit mm -hmm. setting. And so oftentimes when I have patients that have lots of questions, that's what I do. I'm like, let's just schedule, let's schedule an appointment so that we can talk about all of this because then you have my undivided attention and it's, it's just, it's so much easier to check for understanding and like do the back and forth with clarifying questions and all that in person or over the phone than it is in a portal <laughs> or trying to trying to write it all out. And it, it's just, it gets complicated. And so 
that's the other thing um, that my practice is and that I hope that my patients have actually like started to adopt. They're just like, I made an appointment because I have all these questions. Like, yes, perfect. <laughs> um, and I think that that is, it's, it's just a really great way of um, simplifying and streamlining and making sure that you get the information you need and um, when you need it. So I am going to, I'm going to, I haven't shared any like great or not so great stories on my own. So I'm going to throw out just one of my stories of my journey that I would classify as a not so great experience. And then I'm going to actually ask you, Lisa, to choose a very, very good or a very, very bad. It's up to you, whatever you feel comfortable with. So I, and Lisa knows the story, she's heard it before, Carrie may have as well, but when one of the problems that I have faced is I move a lot. I'm not now, I'm at home, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. But when I got diagnosed, it took forever to get a diagnosis. Finally, I was heard. So the first doctor told me the the words that I'll never forget, I'm going to wait and watch you get worse. And I have heard people say that recently. And I've actually heard that in conferences. I've heard presenters say, well, we need to watch and see how it worsens. But that's saying the same thing. So my first tip, if you're a doctor, rheumatologist, anything, be careful how you phrase that sentence (laughs) because uh, that I'll never forget it. I feel like I'm permanently just stained in my brain of that time. I I felt helpless. I felt like, oh my gosh, you mean this is going to get worse? And it's, it's a very, very tough thing to say to somebody. So that was my first negative experience of realizing, wow, I I don't know what's going to happen to me. And what does this mean for my longevity, my livelihood, all of that thing. And then the moving part, when I finally did get someone to diagnose me with something and treat me, and I started feeling much better only to find out when I moved, because I was really in a good, good shape on a biologic and it had complete continuity of care. I wasn't sitting slumped over in a chair. I wasn't sleeping 16 hours a day. I wasn't waking up in the middle of the night in terrible pain and unable to move because I was on continuity of care. I had the right treatment. And they looked at me and said, well, your blood work is great. I don't see any radiographic damage. I don't cannot justify you being on this medication. So they took away my diagnosis and took me off or denied my treatment renewal. And that's how I found Al Kim. <laughs> but anyway, so that's just one example of, you know, and that happens. I wanted to point that out too, because I want people out there to know this, these kind of things happen to everyone, all different walks, walks of people. You might think, oh, well, you know, Tiffany, you, you're experienced in all of this. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But what I am grateful for is I knew, I knew enough to walk away. I knew it wasn't the right relationship. It, I wasn't getting what I needed. And I found a doctor who listened to me and who put me back on medication, thankfully, and, and put me on my way. So, uh, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you about sharing a story, something that could go in this ebook that we're creating. So I, I'm going to share a good story. I'd like to end on a positive note. Um, So I saw a patient who was having non-specific, non-specific symptoms, fatigue, alternating diarrhea and constipation, brain fog, um, problem sleeping, probably things that a lot of us could relate to. And um, she was referred to see me because one of her tests, the anti-nuclear antibody or ANA for short, was a little bit positive, not a ton. And we did a whole history and physical exam, did a whole slew of lab work. And at the end, at that point in time, I did not think that her ANA was um, was indicative of an autoimmune condition. And I didn't think that her symptoms represented an autoimmune condition at that time. And she had had some other 
aspects in her history that pointed maybe towards a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And so the best part about this encounter was that she was so open to just listening and like letting me lay out all of my reasoning um, and take it in for whatever it was that I was offering her. And I, and I was like, you know, some, as many people that were listening know, fibromyalgia has a terrible stigma associated with it. And I said, you know, it, I, I'm not going to even put this in your chart because I don't, I don't want that to follow you. Um, and I, I, if, you know, some people are going to try and make you feel like this is a problem in your head. This is not a problem in your head. We just don't know what causes it. And if we did know what caused it, we would have a treatment for it. Um, and so, but there are things you can do. And this is, you know, kind of like physical therapy and other, other stuff. And I, I've given this, I've, I've laid that, that, that framework so often and um, not very many patients respond in a similar way, but she was just like so grateful for a possible explanation um, and asked appropriate questions afterwards and you know, just wanted to make sure that she was on the right path moving forward that in the end, it was a, a really wonderful experience um, because I felt like I felt like it was a bi-directional exchange. Like I, she was telling me her story. I was kind of trying to put the pieces together and then an opportunity for questions back and forth. And we were both left that encounter feeling like satisfied with what had happened. That That is a great way to sort of tie in as we start to wind down the show. Carrie, did you want to respond to that? Because I know you you were re- you were shaking your head yes, like you were resonating with what she was saying. I was just, you know, doing math in my head and saying, I wish I met you 15 years ago, oh. honestly. Um, I also have fibromyalgia and I will say I knew that I had it four years before I had a doctor actually put it in my chart. And the experience with that, with the dismissal, with the stigma, with, you know, what it is and what it isn't and what else could go along with it and what you can or can't do for it. um, I was lacking all of that, everything that you just said. Um, And so I, I am grateful for doctors like you and on behalf of your patients, I'm going to say thank you because we need more of that. Oh my gosh. Thanks, Gary. Oh, so much, so Gary, much love, so, so much love on the show. So as we are, and I'm going to second what, what Carrie said on that as well. So as we start to wrap up here, I'm just going to go around the table here and I'll just reiterate again, this is the launch of an ebook that we're doing at AI Arthritis that we're calling The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So we can really collect, we hear a lot of stories of ranting and being upset about some negative experience in the doctor's office, which is important to hear for all parties so that we, don't, we can say, oh, how can we improve on this? But equally, we need to hear the good because- I mean, that feels good to know all of the good doctors and good patients and good experiences out there. And then together we can learn and build. So what we're going to be doing is collecting your stories. So we definitely encourage you um, to submit your stories and then pause to Ryan. I have to insert what that link is because I do not have it yet. (laughs) So pause here to insert Um, So we definitely want to hear your stories and then we'll be analyzing the stories like we do when you research, it's called qualitative research. You listen, you, you gather stories, and then you start to find patterns. And we want to work to create some themes and some recommendations on how we can improve that communication and sharing decision-making with our doctors, just improve the overall experience. So Please submit your stories. And as we close out around the table, I just wanted to go around and ask everybody, you know, if you were thinking ahead of the book now, we've collected stories. If you could just think of maybe one recommendation that you would like 
to include in something that you think could help both patients and rheumatologists improve communications and outcomes, what would that be? Um, who wants to start? I Don't go. all jump up at I one can. time. <laughs> I can go. So uh, my feeling is that in a, in a, in a clinic appointment, pa the patient has their agenda and the doctor also has their agenda. And I think the most successful clinic appointments are when we can cross talk between those agendas. And in order to do that, you have to be aware that the other person also has an agenda. Um, and so having that awareness and being cognizant of that and will open up, I think, a lot of opportunities for cross communication. Great. Carrie? Um, I would say the best advice that I would give to, um, to get the most out is to come in prepared with notes um, about what that agenda is. Um, I personally, I use you know my calendar app on on my phone where I have you know the appointment with my doctor, and then in the notes I will you know throughout the time from when I schedule the appointment um, until the day I actually have it. I can always go back in and add. Oh, I also want to ask her about this, and oh, I have to tell her about that. And along with that. I take pictures of things that, um, you know, it, whether it's a rash that is most likely going to be gone at the moment I see my dermatologist or um, a swollen ankle that is most likely going to be down to size by the time I see my, my rheumatologist again. Um, but this way, it's not just a matter of brain fog. I forgot everything I wanted to ask you. And it's not just a matter of, well, everything looks great now. And that's not the end of the discussion. So coming in with the notes and the evidence, the data, the whatever it is that you want to share, um, you know, helps make that conversation go more smoothly. That's that's great, and that is exactly what happens too, isn't it? We okay. <laughs> always we love pictures. Always. <laughs> we bring all the pictures. We bring pictures of your pets and your kids too. <laughs> bring them all. There you go. So then, then I'll just tie those together and I'm going to throw back the listen word that we all started with on here onto the table mm -hmm. and listening to one another and also how can we develop some level of confidence and feeling secure and communicating and asking for help and asking what we need, or if we don't know, and that includes the doctor as well, like being able to be open and less fearful of, of avoid avoidance of communication, I guess. How do we get past that? Because I know that that's been an issue as well. And we hope to work together in creating some guidance on that as well. So there you go. That I think is a good introduction on this really awesome project that we're doing. And I did want to also throw out that this project is going to be primarily led by our volunteers at AI Arthritis. So if you are looking for a great organization to volunteer with, you know, look us up at AIarthritis.org backslash volunteer. And if this is something that you think, wow, I'd like to maybe get part of this. This could be kind of fun. Let us know, sign up, and we'll be in touch on how to get you more involved in this really amazing project. So I just want to thank both Lisa and Carrie for pulling up a seat at the table on this special edition of Roomy Rounds. Carrie, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Sure. Um, so I am also known as a butterfly, um, but I spell it, like I said, I'm from New York. I spell it like we say it. So it's B-U-T-T-A-H-F-L-Y-K for Carrie. Um, you can find me at Butterfly K on Twitter, on Facebook, on basically all of the social media. And Float Like a Butterfly is my website and my column at Sarcoidosis News. All right. And then I don't... <laughs> Sorry again, Ryan. Lisa, do we have social media on you or anything? I don't know. I didn't even think to ask. I have a Twitter. I don't know what my Twitter is. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> at Lisa Zicker. I, I, Lacey does all my tweeting for me. Hang on. That is so funny. Okay. Sorry, Ryan. Just hold. <laughs> you have it? You got it? Okay. All right. And, and Lisa, uh, if anyone would like to find you, where do they find you at? I am on Twitter at Lisa Zicker, that is L-I-S-A-Z as in zebra, I-C-K-U, 
H R. My ancestors just made it complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for, for inviting me to be part of this. I had so much fun. Awesome. And uh, then you can also find our organization at IFAI Arthritis on all the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok. I'm sure I'm probably missing because I don't run our social media. So I'm not really familiar with all of the platforms that we're on, but you can find us there. So we definitely want you to be part of this because this very much so all voices matter, your stories count. And we hope by collecting all of them that we will be able to change the situations and the stories of tomorrow. So thank you again to my amazing co host and guest and uh, stay tuned for more about this project and how we can work together. Thank you all. Mm-hmm.